Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Business Growth Show, where we talk about all components of business and how to utilize them for exponential growth. My name is Nathan Cassiotis. I'm a business growth strategist where I help business owners grow and scale to create freedom and choice. And today, I have an awesome guest. He's a trainer, speaker, coach, presenter, podcast host, and the director at JP Coaching and Training, and the founder of the Emotional Fitness Formula. He's an expert in human behavior and is degree qualified in psychology and sociology. He helps clients and organizations improve their effectiveness and results by coaching them on managing their own emotional fitness. And he has been working in the field since 2006 and is trained well in excess of 7,000 coaches. Welcome, Joe Pane, and thank you for being on my show. Thanks, Nathan. I appreciate you having me. Yeah, you're welcome, mate. I'm sure it's going to be an awesome show for everyone watching and listening today. So you're a very successful entrepreneur. So for those people who don't know who you are, please introduce yourself by telling us about you and your journey. Well, uh, as we sit here in about another week, I celebrate my 26th wedding anniversary with my lovely wife. Uh, we've got twin boys who are 14. Um, and uh, we moved our lives from Melbourne to Noosa, as you know, and which has been, as we were talking off air before, it's been quite an amazing uh, shift. Loved it, loved it, loved it. Yeah, so back in um, 2003, 2004, uh, I just found myself uh, disengaging just with my career. Um, what used to excite me just no longer sparked interest in me at all. And um, I was I, I, basically I got lost, just like I was just sharing at that conference that you and I reconnected at. And um, and I had no idea what to do. And it was just by sheer luck that one weekend when I got home from work, uh, Sylvana, my wife, had a dear friend of hers over who was just hyper excited about something she had just experienced. And so after exploring what the hell had happened to her, she started sharing about this meditation retreat that she did. And um, <clears throat> the company that ran it, I got curious about it. I went on online. This is back in yeah, 03. So websites were very, very different and much more simpler than what they are now. So this website was just three or four pages. I read everything on there. I rang them up, spoke to the director who just happened to answer the phone, and I asked for a job there. <laughs> And uh, they had no job. And uh, and then I just remember it was a, a little micro mini defining moment because I said some words that I'd never said in my life. And that was, I said to the lady on the phone, her name was Marlies, just a gorgeous, beautiful woman, uh, great soul. Um, I said to her, well, if you're willing to have me, I'm, I'm happy to come and work for you for nothing. And I couldn't believe that these words had escaped my mouth it was like oh my god what are you saying man and um long and the short of it is we had a series of meetings and i started working with, with them um and i was on a sabbatical effectively for about 15 months and what i didn't know was that um i had embarked on a journey that we all embark on which is a journey from ambition to meaning it's a journey where we move away from the egocentric existence of personality and we start moving more toward a heart-centric spirit oriented kind of energy uh, where we become more aligned. Our psychology becomes more aligned to nature and all good things and how things should be kind of thing. If that makes any sense. And um, yeah, so I, I, I experienced lots of um, incredible experiences in that 15 months. Um, so I ended up embarking on a diploma of teacher training and meditation. And, um, but it was a very, it wasn't your typical diploma. It was very experiential effort. Like we had to go out and do these residential retreats. You know, there was seven-day silent retreats. There was a five-day vision quest, which was very challenging. Um, you know, immersing in sweat lodges and sitting in medicine wheels or, you know, circles for three days, 72 hours straight with no food, no no watches, no pen, no phone, no books, nothing. Just you, me and the trees. You know, that was pretty much it. And, yeah, it was, um, it was a fascinating journey because um, – you know, during those times, especially the, the 72 hours out in the wild, and it was literally in the wild because it was a it was a real camp. There was no power. There was no running water. There was no toilets. There was no, it was just us in, the, in, the, in this bush in the Grampians of Victoria. Um, you know, I, I got to learn more about self-reliance. I got to learn more about how to embrace every single micro moment. You know, how do we, I improved massively my relationship with uncertainty. I got to you know, expand my purview on life and my perspective on things and um, began to realize that there's so much more to life than just little old me. 
And yeah, it was it was life changing to say the extreme least. And then when I came back from that, I had to th that was over after fifteen months, and I was running out of money because I hadn't earned any money for that time, and I hadn't been a good saver at that stage or a, 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 a um, disciplined investor or whatever you want to call it. So I had to keep working, and uh, I went back to my old job and found. Just like when you try to rekindle a relationship that was dead five years ago, it just is not the same. It just doesn't work. So the people were phenomenal, still are phenomenal in that old workplace of mine. Uh, but when I went back, I just simply didn't fit. I didn't feel any connection emotionally. Uh, it was just, it was over. It was just like, you can't beat, this is a terrible saying, you can't beat a dead horse or whatever they say. You just, I mean, you can, but nothing happens. You know, it's like, it doesn't matter. It doesn't do anything. So... I, I then literally, I was literally <laughs> sitting under a tree having a sandwich for lunch. Uh, no, it wasn't an apple tree and no, nothing fell on my head. But I'm sitting under this tree reading this magazine as I'm chewing on this lunch. It was, a, it was called Living Now. It was, a, it was back in Melbourne. It was a personal development spiritual magazine. And I saw an ad, how you can have your own personal development business. And I thought, you've got to be kidding me. Is this real? And it was about life coaching. And uh, and it was an invitation to an information evening that just over in Melbourne, in South Melbourne. So I uh, I went. Uh, Silvana came with me. Silvana's my wife. She came with me and loved everything I had to say. It resonated effortlessly with me. Uh, the next morning, I signed up for their program. I be I embarked on another diploma program in coaching, and uh, that was in two thousand and five. And in February two thousand and six, I officially started my business and um, worked quite strongly, thousands of hours uh, working with uh, people one-on-one. -on -one. That was my focus initially, I think it was like just to get started and all that kind of thing. And then I also began to learn the realities of business, which is, you know, you've got to go out and establish new relationships. Um, what was interesting was I thought to myself, oh, you should go back to the real estate industry, which is where I was working for a while. You know, they know you, you know, uh, maybe you'll get coaching clients that way. And what I found was astounding, which is, not understanding at all now, but back then it was, was I went back to all the offices that I knew and, the, and my former competitors and I said, oh, and I was offering them trainings in personal development and mindset stuff and, and I got rejected 100% by all of them because they said to me, they didn't say it like this, I said it more nicely, but in essence I was saying, you were a, you were a competitor and now you're a coach. It's like suddenly you're a switch, you've done this. It's like they didn't see who I had become. It's kind of like, I don't know about your family, Ethan, but my my parents, especially my dad, still sees a version of me that died a long time ago. They have no idea. What you saw me do on stage there at that conference, they have no idea. I can't explain it to them. And, and so what happened was those agents were seeing me as something I was no longer. And as a result of that, I, 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 it was actually quite hard because then I thought, oh, my God, I have to go and see people that, that I don't know that have never met me because that's the new identity. It's a new way of them seeing it. It's like, it's, it's like if, it's like in my, in one of my trainings ones, in fact, I can tell you in that conference, I met a woman who has got a very spiritual meditation kind of business, right? And she was 23 years, a cop, I think for this in Sydney, New South Wales police force. And I said to her, I said, you know, that if I hadn't met you as a cop, there is no way on earth that I would see you as a spiritual teacher that you are now. Whereas I'm glad I met you now because you're brilliant and I can't imagine you being a cop. So this is really important because in business, how we define ourselves and how we present ourselves, how we, what we say that we are, that becomes your blueprint to that person. It's like, oh yeah, Athan is an expert in business. Athan is an expert in X, Y, and Z. But maybe back in, in, in 1998, you were an expert in ABC, a completely different skill set. So that was a lesson I learned early. And then, yeah, I went, I, I did all the networking and stuff and built my business in 06 and um, got going pretty quickly. And then in 08, 09 and 2010, I started expanding into group work. Um, and then 2011, 2012 and so on, I pretty much, you know, the one-on-one -on -one work was very, was very minimal and all of it was group work. And uh, I started getting exposed and introduced to all kinds of markets. Um, from corporate markets to small business markets to local, you know, social football clubs and stuff like that, through to uh, school principals, primary school principals, primary school teachers, secondary school teachers a little bit, um, 
you, you name the market, I've pretty much been in front of them now in the last 16 years. And so that's been developing over that time. And then in 2019, going to 2020, as everything changed with the whole COVID situation, um, my framework for the Emotion Fitness Formula just came together because I was getting more and more invitations to run workshops to help people with their anxieties, their stresses, depressions. We're talking non-clinical issues here, non-clinical. Some of them were clinical, but most of them were non-clinical. And, um, and I thought to myself, well, I started putting this framework together. I thought, you know, if I'm running a series of workshops, say for your company, I'd be going, well, okay, well, what's the journey I'm going to take these guys on? And what's the point? What's the outcome of it? How, how's, what's this going to help them with? And that's when I started thinking, oh my God, it became obvious to me. It was like, I'm helping them improve their relationship with uncertainty. That's my mission. And by mission, I don't mean beat chesting, beat chest, chest beating, um, you know, on top of the mountain going, this is what I mean. It's not what I mean. What I mean was that language just fell into place. And I thought, that's, that's what I do. So when people ask, what is the emotional fitness formula? I can say exactly that. It helps you massively improve how you relate to uncertainty. And every aspect of this formula and every aspect of the framework is designed to help you with that. And as you know, there's five key areas which we'll discuss at some point in our conversation here. But um, yeah, so that was the formulation of the boost that we all got in uncertainty because most of us had no clue how we were going to land, whether we were going to land on our feet, on our head, or even survive it. And luckily, I mean, I'm dare so for you it would be similar, um, we landed on our feet and uh, and we took off. We were one of the blessed lucky ones, pure lucky ones, that because of COVID, the business went like to, you know, it doubled, almost tripled. And, and the emotional fitness formula began to take off. And then when earlier this year, we um, created a certification program and that's just, that's just gone, eight droppings, it's gone nuts. And uh, yeah, so that's um, a bit of a purview or a helicopter ride over the, uh, the journey. Yeah, awesome, mate. What a powerful journey um, that you've gone through in the transformation i can definitely agree with um the parent side of thing with my parents only working jobs their whole life and they're like what do you mean these businesses what do you actually do so i can definitely understand that you know how they perceive us and what we actually do they they don't really understand but you know as long as they love us that's the main thing and that's um, right you know and I think one thing um, I'd like to touch on first is about emotions and business, because I think, you know, the correlation between them has changed a little bit over the years, because a lot of people are like, you shouldn't have emotions in business. It's not good, right? But then people are starting to work out, you know, wait a minute, we have these emotions, like, you know, what are we doing with them? Um, so maybe just initially, what are your thoughts, you know, around, you know, emotions and, and doing business, you know, and, and how we make yeah. decisions and things like that? Yeah, yeah, completely. Um, so... The quality of our lives is 100% determined by the quality of our experiences. And I, I was running a workshop yesterday for um, about 170 employees of the of MBN. And the fellow who introduced me, uh, it, was for, it was for the uh, Are You OK Day, which was yesterday. And it was wonderful. And the fellow who introduced me, he was one of the general managers there, he, he quoted a, a study. He said that we spend one third of our lifetime in our employee, whether it's in our own businesses, you know, whatever, with people that we're working with. And, and that's when I shared with the group, and I'll share it here, is that, as I, just, as I was just saying, the quality of our life is determined absolutely by the quality of our experiences. And being in business is, is another experience, whether, it's, whether I, I'm at home looking after one of my boys, whether I am going for a run or in business or making a sale or whatever, it's an experience. And you cannot experience anything without emotion. Like if, for an experience to have a meaning, it's got to have emotion in it. So emotion flavors and colors every nook and every cranny of every experience. And if we're spending one third of our lifetime in business as an employee or as an employer or as a team member or whatever our positions are, sole trader, whatever, then uh, you kind of want to become you know, emotionally well and emotionally fit so you can handle the absolutely guaranteed, uncertain, pressure, stressful situations. And um, because what happens is if you can imagine like an invisible flow chart here with my hand, I'll do it with my hands. If you can imagine up here is focus, like thought. 
And so thought and focus are the same thing. Whatever you're focusing on is what you're thinking about. What you're thinking about is what you're focusing on. So if I am in a situation in my work, in my business, where I'm, I'm finding it particularly stressful, the reason why I'm finding a particular experience of that micro moment or macro moment stressful is because I am focusing on an event where I am interpreting that event with a meaning I'm giving what I'm focusing on and the meaning that I'm giving that thought immediately produces, creates, fabricates, manufactures an emotion. And that emotion then colors the experience I'm having of that stress or of that joy or of that whatever I'm experiencing. So one of the first things about emotional fitness I would love to teach your audience is that emotions don't respond to facts. <laughs> Emotions respond to our interpretation of the facts. And so the meaning that we're giving that particular experience of that moment in our working life, it's the meaning that we're giving it that is manufacturing the emotion. The illusion, Athan, is, oh, no, no, you don't get it, Joe. It's just how I feel. No, how you feel, it happens so fast that the illusion is just how I feel. No, you create, you've contributed to how you're feeling by what you're focusing on and what you are making that focus mean. You know, the example I shared with the NBN people yesterday was like, imagine you're having one of the most depressing days you've ever had in your career, in your business. Let's just say, right? And a friend of yours rings and says, hey, you wouldn't believe it. You don't know this, but I entered the lottery a few weeks ago and you were part of it, but you don't know. I wanted to... But guess what? And they're going nuts. We've won five million bucks. It's like, what? Uh -huh. And it's true, but then it's true. Now, in that moment of feeling, experiencing one of the most depressing days in the work environment, are you going to say to your friend, listen, I'm having one of the most depressing days of my career. Can we talk about this later? It's like, you're not going to say that. You're going to freak, man. You're going to be, you might even be thinking because you're having the most depressing day of your uh, working life. You might be thinking, oh my God, I've just been given an exit doorway. This is amazing. And you're, but the, it might seem like a ludicrous example. But by shifting your focus onto something else that makes you feel good because of the meaning that you're giving it, shifts entirely your emotional state. And that's what the emotional fitness formula is all about. It's all of these different perspectives and angles and frameworks that are different tools or whatever you want to call them. I don't like the word tools, but it's just different ways and avenues of how you can shift the way you are experiencing something. Because you can be in the same physical environment, in the same room, same office with somebody else, and you are experiencing something completely different to that person sitting right next to you. Completely different. But to give you another example, you could be at the footy. If you're into the footy, pretend that you follow the footy, just for the sake of this example. And you're with your mate or your, or your girlfriend or your boyfriend or your whatever, and you your team is winning and their team is losing. Right? And the siren goes off, your team's won, they, their team is lost. In that micro moment of the siren, you're in the same physical environment, same experience, but completely different emotion because the meaning that you're giving the event is completely different. Well, but that's obvious, Joe, because you know, winning and losing footy, it's the same in life. It's exactly the same. So an emotionally fit person is aware of how they've created, how they're feeling. They become insatiably curious as to how they did that and how they can undo that and shift it to something else by shifting focus. Think of it this way, I think, and you've been in my, one of my trainings before, which I just discovered and you reminded me of, which is lovely. I might have shared this with you that, at that training, I'm not, I'm not sure, but it's kind of like if I have a radio here, literally a radio, and I'm tuning in, just pretend if you're younger than 30, just pretend you have a radio. I know it's all on Spotify. But anyway, if you're tuning into a radio station, Spotify would be the same. Uh, and let's just say that the station is playing 80s music, 1980s music, and your friend is tuning into talkback radio. The radio is the radio. Think of the radio as the human being. And he's listening to talkback radio about some depressing news about what's going on overseas somewhere, and I'm listening to 80s music. We're both using the same radio, and we're experiencing completely different experiences in that moment. We feel completely differently. Now, a question I often get asked is, here with that analogy is, well, John, aren't you in denial? Aren't you living in denial of what's going on overseas or what's going on here or what's going on there? And the answer is absolutely not because you can't focus on everything at once. 
I can't tune into all of the radio stations in the world all at once. Am I in denial listening to 80s music that other radio stations exist? No, I'm aware that other radio stations exist. I've consciously chosen to focus on, on the 1980s uh, music or whatever I'm, he's, he's focusing on the talkback, he's consciously chosen to go to talkback radio. But we know that there are many other stations. And so um, emotions are the same. So you can't, if I was trying to tune into the talkback and to the 80s and in between, so trying to get them both, you can't, you get white noise. Emotions are the same, method. You can't be afraid and excited at the same time. You can't be experiencing love and fear at the same time. You can't be experiencing gratitude and depression at the same time. It's one or the other. It's a station. And, and it might sound like I'm simplifying emotions, hopefully not, but let me tell you that uh, human behavior, of course, is very complex, but these strategies have uh, been tried and tested on thousands of people hundreds of times, and which is why I, can, I, I, I speak of them with you know a deep certainty. Yeah, I love it, Joe. You're definitely in flow then and loved all of that. Very powerful and a great segue into the emotional fitness formula that you've created. So let us know, you know, what these five uh, stages are and um, and then we can obviously delve into each of them a little bit more as well. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Ethan. Yeah, so there's, there's five key focus areas uh, that I have decided over the course of my 16 years of experience. I thought these five areas... You master these is pretty. It's pretty good. Like you'd be you'd be doing really well. And so that first area, the first one, first focus area is, is identity. So identity is our self concept. It's how it is that we've we've chosen to define ourselves. So I might be defined by my relationships. I might be defined by my career. I might be defined by my results. I might be defined by my body and my house and my car. I might be defined by my legacy. There's so many things we can be defined by. And the reason why this is really important and also powerful is that identity is the single most powerful um, force in the human condition because we will do anything to remain consistent with how we see ourselves to the point where we may even override our values to remain consistent to how we see ourselves. And so if I'm defined by my career, so how does, this relate, how does that relate to my relationship to uncertainty? So if I'm defining myself by my results, I'm getting in my work, I'm, and that's my that's who I am. That's how I, my psychology is. This is who I am. I am, you know, a business owner. I am a business owner specializing in X, Y, Z. If that's my definition, anytime something comes along to threaten that business, whether it's um, or a job, and whether it's the end of that job coming or something happening in a marketplace that's beyond my control, it could spell the end of my work or something quite powerfully negative, um, I'm going to be experiencing amplified stress, incredible uncertainty that I'll have trouble navigating with clarity because I'm taking it completely personally because my identity is that. Because you see, if my if your identity or mine, if, if it just disappears overnight, and we don't know who we are, that's a crisis. We experience it as a form of a crisis, whether it's a depression crisis, an anxiety crisis, a midlife crisis, all crises are identity crises. So when I worked at Ford Motor Company as a rehabilitation counselor back in the 90s, there was a, um, back then they allowed people to work on, so Ford Motor Company, you know, 80% of the jobs there were very physical, on the line producing 400 plus units a day. So a lot of the job was repetitive. If I'm doing this all day, I'm, I'm literally just doing this all day, putting that cover on that thing and whatever I'm doing, right? And uh, they didn't, you know, at 65, you didn't have to leave. You can stay for as long as you wanted. This is back in the 90s. And I remember there was uh, three, three or four fellows who were now approaching 75 who were struggling to keep up with the line. And no matter what position they put them in on the line, they would make mistakes and they just couldn't afford the line to keep stopping and all the other things that go with that. And so they gave them a, uh, they gave them the sack, but they actually just retired them nicely and they got a little bit of a payout and whatever else they got and, and, and acknowledged and celebrated. These guys on average were working at Ford Motor Company for 36, 37 years. And it was their community. It was their identity. And so when their identity or their job was taken away, along with it went their identity. And they all experienced a crisis of some kind. Three of them ended up passing away within six months. Two of them ended it themselves. And I say that very, very carefully because it 
good chance that one of your listeners has been touched by by suicide. So I say that with great sensitivity and yeah. And, and the other one just passed away. I don't know. I can't. Remember, I don't actually know how. And 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 the other one or two were were suffering with depression. And that's how powerful identity is. So if I am defining myself by my job and that job gets threatened, that translates to you are threatening my essence of who I am and I can't handle that. Whereas if I'm not defined by my job and I can still perform my work really well and run my business really well because I'm defining myself by something else, which you can do and you learn how to do that with all this work, you define yourself by your legacy, you define yourself by just something completely different. Sure, the inevitable uncertainties will come in your workplace, it doesn't mean that uncertainty will be easier to navigate, but you'll be able to navigate it more effect effectively, more efficiently with clarity because you're not taking it so personally. Is that making sense, Anthony? Yeah, definitely, mate. I love it. Identity is extremely powerful. Um, I yeah. agree. And we have to keep shifting it right over time. Like we get it keeps to evolving. evolving. Yeah, it keeps evolving. Yeah. It evolves over, over a lifetime. Yeah. And then, and then there's the second key focus area is uh, what we call life stages. Uh, so life stages is not so much your age, but life stages psychologically. So where you're at on your journey from ambition to meaning. So as I, was, as I was highlighting about 15 minutes ago or so, the ambition to meaning journey is a journey to the center of your, your, your soulful earth. It's the journey to the center of your heart. It's a journey to spirit, which is a whole other conversation. Um, and in essence, it's becoming in a very healthy way, very curious about well, what happens after our body dies? What happens? What is it that what what is this universal intelligence that is speaking through my my mouth and what's looking through your eyes back to me? What is that universal intelligence? What is it that makes our heart beat? I mean, we're we're not in control of our heartbeat. We're not in control of the next breath. As I shared at the conference, we may all have the same hours in every day, but we don't all have the same number of days. We don't have all the same number of breaths. We don't know when the last breath is coming. And by the time you realize it, it doesn't matter. You're out of the body anyway. You're in the non-physical. And in the non-physical, it's just a, it's a different, it's a different, um, <laughs> it's a different kind of experience. <laughs> it's stating the obvious, isn't it? So it, it, it's 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 so um I find with identity and life stages, because they all blend in together. Because with life stages, you go through the stage of Defining yourself by your physicality. I am my body, I am my car, I am my body image, I am my house, I am my material possessions. We evolve eventually where our responsibilities expand. We have now got a career, we might have a business going, we've got responsibilities, we might be married with a family, we might be having our first child, we might be engaging in our first mortgage or rental agreement or whatever that financial obligation is. And now suddenly our identity expands from body and house and image and stuff it expands into my skill set. I'm defined by my skills. I'm defined by my results. I'm defined by my job. I'm defined by my career. What's what am I building here? It's, it's a building phase. I'm you know get the girl, get the guy, get the skill, get the experience, get the wisdom, get the knowledge, you get the victories, get the losses. You know, experience all that. You're building yourself. Then eventually, from and that's all the ambition driven world. And then we eventually move into the meaning driven world where we're becoming more heart centric. And in here. The, 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 the focus changes. Instead of like, what am I building? It becomes, what am I leaving behind? What am I giving? What I'm being defined here now, my, my identity is shifted into legacy. And the closer, and then from there, you eventually move into spirit. And, 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 and Carl Jung described the spirit fourth phase of identity as the death of the ego. It's the death of this preparation for death. And the death of the ego. And, and so that's a whole other conversation we've got time to fill in here. But, um, let me tell you that the closer you are to that fourth phase, the closer you are to, this is a vague comment, but the closer you are to being able to access spirit, that can be interpreted in a thousand ways. Um, I'm telling you, as your identity moves away from all those psychological definitions, more into spirit, more into existential, as your identity moves more into the existential phase rather than psychological phases, you can, the closer you are to existential, you can handle anything. You can handle anything. So, for example, right? This is, I'm not meaning to be funny here, but um, obviously I've got I've got no hair. At the moment, fine company, of course. <laughs> and <clears throat> but when I lost my hair, so at 19, so I lost. I started going bald at 26, 27, 30, something like that. 
um, when I was 19, I was at that first phase of identity, which was the identity of athlete, the identity I've been defined by my body, my bike, my car, my hair, because it was long and curly and you could go got a lot of attention and all the rest of it. If I had lost my hair, this sounds ridiculous, but we need to understand this. If I had lost my hair at 19, where it was part of my identity, I would have experienced a crisis, which would make me vulnerable to anxiety and depression, right? Because it was part of my identity. Thankfully, the hair was lost later when I was defining my identity had moved into work, into this is what I am. I am a rehabilitation counselor. I am a consultant. I'm a coach. I'm a this, I'm a that. And the hair was falling out. It, was it bothering me? It was giving me the shits. But did it, did, was it a crisis? Nowhere near it. It was an acceptance. Oh, well, looks like you have to just go number one. Done. And we move on. But can you see, Anthony, if that had happened at a different life stage, it wouldn't have been just, oh, I'm just going to get rid of it. So, no, it would have been a crisis. So our identity and our life stage work together. And depending on how we define ourselves and what life stage we're at, <clears throat> we can easily avoid crises. Or if we're stuck in one, it's because of an identity crisis. And the closer we are to spirit and to the existential side, becoming, you know, educating ourselves and just, just expanding our minds beyond the physical. Because there is, it's the arrogance of the ego to think that nothing exists on the other side of the veil. That is pure arrogance of the ego. There, there is so much more. In fact, this is, we're, we're on the small side of the, of the equation. So um, the closer you are to that, the, 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 um, the more emotionally well, emotionally fit you are, which means you can handle any uncertainty. And the third focus area is values. <clears throat> so values is like our emotional compass. It's what someone called uh, our standard of behavior, which I love that definition. And emotional fitness is, yeah, fundamentally the values are fundamentally our emotional compass, which influences every decision that we ever make. And uh, when you're living in alignment to your values, you feel amazing. When you're, out of, when you're misaligned, you feel shit, basically, to put it as frankly as I can. So, so what happens is you've got your identity that's evolving, the life stages that are moving along, and your values evolve along with the identity and with the life stages. Now, if my identity has moved over here or my values have moved over here and there's no alignment, like we're out of alignment, I'm going to be having a hard time with uncertainty. Any uncertainty that comes up, I'm going to have a hard time dealing with it. So, so the reason why I left my job to start my coaching consulting business was because my coaching consulting business was a more accurate expression of the values I had become. Whereas my old job, I wasn't aligned anymore to the values of the ambition-driven world. I just wasn't. So that's why I wasn't feeling it. So I moved to this other area. And then, but nothing stays still. Everything keeps moving. So it's, it's the ultimate is the alignment of all of these, but you get everything moving along in different places and space. And this is the same in relationships. It's the same in every aspect of life. And the fourth phase, oh, the fourth phase, the fourth part, the focus area, the, the fourth focus point, the focus area of emotional fitness is emotional flexibility which we've touched on briefly here already, how emotions, we, we fabricate the emotions that, that we experience in our lives, like pretty much. So that's emotional flexibility. And then the fifth one, the final one is perspective. So perspective is our, is our worldview. It's our philosophy. It's kind of like our generalized beliefs about what life means. You know, life is, relationships are, family are, men are, women are, Australia is, and so on. That formulates our perspective. And the health of our perspective is determined by the health of our beliefs at that level. And so part of being an emotionally fit person is having what I call a clean perspective. And a clean perspective means having the ability to instantly access gratitude whenever, it doesn't matter what the situation is. And the better you are at accessing gratitude, the more uncertainty you can handle. Yeah. So... That's the essence of the emotional fitness formula. I mean, there are multiple layers to all of that, but that's a good, a good summary for your listeners. Yeah, I love it, Joe. So amazing and and so deep. And some people might be like, "Wow, there's a lot of stuff here," and, and it obviously could question, you know, their beliefs and things like that. And I guess one thing that I'd like to say to everyone, based on what you've said, is that I always have a lens of curiosity, and when I learn from somebody new, like yourself or anybody, I always go in very open. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm going to go in open. I'm going to take in everything as if I, you know, I choose to believe everything so that the, you know, there's no filter there of the yeah. information. 
And then after I can choose, right? And see, you know, and then and then even get more curious. Go, I love what Joe said about this. I'm going to look into this a little bit more about how to get in touch with my spirit. And, you know, how do I go to other areas and learn from other people or, or modalities or whatever it is that's going to help me to get to that path. So I think that's an important distinction for everyone. It's it, we're all on our journey and just get that curiosity to to look into those areas and that will really help you, you know, on the journey as love well. It. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, great. Love it. Yeah, awesome, mate. And you know, one thing for me, um, and I think it's um, you know, not to be um, you know, stereotypical, but for men, um, you know, more than um women is suppressing emotions a lot, right? Uh, I think um, you know, we're just like, you know, in, in the Aussie thing is like just shut up, just get on with it, you know, type of thing like that in terms of the culture here. And I'm sure it's like that around the world as well. So if we've suppressed our emotions, you know, for a long period of time, so we're sort of out of tune with feeling them naturally. You know, what are some things that you can share with us of how we can, you know, get that muscle firing again, so to speak, to get back in touch with our emotions and then also, I guess, process them, you know, which is important at the same time. Yeah, way. great question. So <laughs> there's lots of answers to that question. So with the time that we have, I'll pick one. And, and the one I'll, I'll share with you is that we need to have at least one person in our lives, whether it's a friend, a mate, a partner, husband, wife, whatever, we need someone in our life who we can be completely unedited, unfiltered, raw, express our truth without being judged, just to even begin expressing a truth, to even begin. And this is really crucial because when you've got a person and you've got two people that's even better, like I'm very lucky in my life. I've got my wife that I can be like that with. And I've got a best mate who was my best man at my wedding and we've known each other since 1989, uh, you know, that I can be with and, and in turn him with me and my wife with me. Uh, to give you a superficial kind of an example, just a little example, well, be, before I do, just because this will make more sense for that when I, let me explain like this, is that emotions, as I shared at the conference, the emotions have to move. And if they don't move, they get projected onto somebody else. And so an emotion that hasn't been dealt with, expressed, spoken about, moved through the system, it can't stay in you forever. So what will happen is we'll be triggered by somebody else's behavior and overreact to that person. We haven't got time to go into all the nooks and crannies of that here, but it explains why so many men and women experience anger that comes like that and they don't even know why they're angry i've experienced it all of us have and one of the ways to explain that is that it's unexpressed emotion that is unconscious that now is being projected to somebody else and we become convinced that it's them so in other words you know the, the client the example of the client that i shared at the conference was who would, who would turn to anger at the sight of a provocatively dressed woman, this, this female client of mine. And, and I'm cutting a very long story into like two minutes. So in essence, what she was doing was she didn't know that she was actually projecting unconscious memories and emotions that were stored in her body from when she was a kid. Because when she was a kid, she had a father and mother who were both loving and endearing to her and treated her with love and respect and all those wonderful things that you would hope for as a, as a child. However, when the father and the mother were talking to each other, he was very violent to her. And on uh, numerous occasions, she would end up in hospital, the, 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 her mum. And so she was a witness to that for many, many, many years. And she also had to embrace the non-emotional masculine sort of side to be a protector of her mother as best as she could be. So she pretty much dumped the feminine side of her, the expressive, open part of herself. So that got suppressed and, and slowly opened over time, that, that part of her, but not completely. And that emotion hadn't completely left her body. So it gets stored as an unconscious memory, an unconscious emotional thing. And, and what triggers it out of her is a provocatively dressed woman. Now, the reason why that is is because it's an aspect of herself that she hasn't embraced yet. And I'm not talking about her literally becoming a provocatively dressed woman. I'm talking about the embracing of whatever that represents in her interpretation, whether it's femininity or whatever beauty or whatever it might be, right? So for men or women, if you don't have someone in your life to express any form of truth, it gets built up in you. 
So I'll give you a superficial example. Just this morning, at the time of this recording, we all know, you know, the, the Queen passed away at the age of 96, right? What a great life, right? Regardless of what you think of the Queen or the whole uh, royal family, um, I said, uh, I, I saw... I saw a post on LinkedIn from a colleague. This would be a very small world if he was listening to this, but it doesn't matter. Uh, I saw a, a, a post on LinkedIn. How sad, uh, you know, I really feel for the royal family. Sure, of course, the immediacy, the intimate family. But, you know, we're all in mourning. Like London is, you know, UK is in mourning and how sad. This is a real, you know, a real big loss. And I responded, I, I, I really do this, right? But that was a little minor trigger in me because I thought, no, no. So I, I responded, which I really do this, right? I said, this is not a life lost. This is a life lived. We all know that we're going to die. Like she was 96. It's a life that you celebrate, not a life that you mourn. You mourn Princess Diana if you want to mourn. That's tragedy. That's a life lost at the age of 37 or whatever age she was. Or someone in your life that's died tragically well before you know, when we say well before their time, which basically means they haven't met the average life expectancy timeline of a man or a woman, right? So, you know, like my father-in-law, my in-laws who are staying here at the moment, I mean, he's 84. He's doing okay, but he's not the fittest of 84-year-olds. You know, whenever, whenever he passes, is it going to be a shock? Of course it'll be a shock, that initial, oh, wow, he's gone, Right. And then there's the processing of it. There's the accepting of it. There's all of that. And then within a few days, I can tell you now, we'll be celebrating the life that he has lived and what he's given his family. It's a life well lived, not a life that has been lost. And the reason why I'm telling you this is because when I saw that, I felt an emotion in my body that was in complete disagreement with this particular part. And then I shared that with my wife. And this conversation I'm having with you, I had with her this morning. And so because I know that anything that I feel needs to be moved out. Because if it doesn't get moved out, it accumulates with all these other memories and emotions, and then it comes out on the wrong person at the wrong time as a projection of anger, and you won't know what the hell's going on. So it's really, really important that whenever you feel something, you have someone that you can talk to. Maybe don't post on in response to someone who's within. Um, you, you have someone that to talk to who um, can, who would genuinely just listen and not judge you. That's really important, Nathan. That is so important. Now, some of you listeners might be thinking, well, that sounds good, Joe, but I don't have anyone in my life who I can be unedited and unfiltered with. Well, if that happens to be the case for some of you listening here, this might sound a little bit, I don't know how this is going to sound. I'll just share with you. The question you need to be asking yourself is, who do I need to become to have a relationship like that, a friendship like that? Who do I need to become? And the answer is that the clue is in what you are wanting in another, you need to embrace within yourself. Yeah. yeah. So there you have it. Definitely. And that, that, that movement of emotion, that's why I call it emotional fitness. Physical fitness can only exist when you move. Without movement, forget about it. But emotional fitness, same thing. The emotion has to move. Otherwise, you become emotionally unwell and you become extremely vulnerable to anxiety and depression. Yeah. Wow. I love that, Joe. Definitely, we have to love ourselves and, and embrace that to be able to love others at the same time. Really powerful. Thank you for sharing um, all of that there. And um, I, you are a great speaker on stage. I've seen you, you know, do um, a few day events and at conferences and things like that. You're, you're awesome at how you, Thank uh, you. yeah, bring your, your different personality and, and all the different elements of your stories and things like that into it. Um, I just like to quickly ask, you know, for, for many of us here, you know, I think speaking is a skill that we should all be learning, right? Whether it's in, in just small groups or, you know, on a big stage in front of everyone, uh, especially if on stage, you know, if, if we, we're getting on there and, and want to be, you know, impacting many people, you know, at once, what's some tips that you could give us so that we could be, you know, a better speaker on stage so we can get our message across and, and make more of an impact? Wow, that's a really big question. Because um, we can't minimize that to just a couple of tips, but... Um, what's the best way I can answer this question? So something that a mentor of mine said to me a long time ago was when you're on stage, this is the same in life, um, you come from the space of having nothing to prove and nothing to defend. 
So how you answer one, you know, how you answer a question from the audience or how you make a point about X, Y, Z. You're saying it with the energy that I'm not saying this to you to prove or defend. I'm just saying I'm sharing it with you. That kind of energy, that, that's, that's a really important tip. I think also by presenting over and over, it's also an avenue of getting to know yourself. So understanding what you can bring. Um, this is going to be a weird comment, Ethan. This is a weird comment. But two people that have inspired me in my speaking uh, experiences is Prince and Michael Jackson, Love it. who are both sadly dead, who were dead you know, in their 50s. And I said, to, I said to my wife, have you noticed how so many more people are dead now than when we were 22? Like, you know, at 52, we're, we're both 52, so why don't I? Like, listen to the radio. It's like, the other day, I listened to five songs in a row, and they were all dead. It's like, that never happened when we were 22. And I said, this is a sign of us getting old. The conveyor belt's getting shorter. So we need to make sure that we're living our life, right? Which we are. We love it. Anyway, Prince and Michael Jackson, why did they inspire me? Because Prince, who I saw live three or four times, um, wasn't relying on a PowerPoint, wasn't relying on a set, set, like, oh, no, Purple Rain can only play it in the fourth session. He jammed his way through. I reckon his musicians didn't know the next song. I don't think Prince even knew the next song. It just would come. And they would, it would formulate into one symphony of just incredible hits. And the creativity, spontaneous creativity inspired me. So as a speaker, my songs are the ideas that I have. And so I have no attachment to the order of those ideas. However, those ideas get expressed. When you saw me at the Blueprint Conference, I didn't know how I was going to open. I just simply, and this is just coming from experience, I guess, but I went on stage and I thought the room will tell me how I need to open, just just, the, just what we call is calibrate the room, like get a bit of a feel. And um, so I started with the meditation stories and that just, it just connected with the room. I, I didn't know I was going to open without, I just did. And that's the inspiration of Prince. Right? Who might open with a song, but after that, it's like, hey, we're, we're, we're going wherever this crowd takes us, wherever the energy takes us. And Michael Jackson was a little bit different. He was a lot more set. Like, his songs and everything was set. He would cry at the same beat, and that, that part I didn't like at all. But what inspired me about him was the way he was able to sing. He could sing a line with all these additional sounds and the way he would do it that no one else could ever do. Like, no one can replicate his songs. His actual tone, no one can replicate it. No one will come near it. Um, and I love the variation in his tone. So to me, that translates to a variation of energy, a variation of characters that can come into your presentation, aspects of yourself that people don't even know maybe even exist. It could be a serious aspect of yourself, a funny aspect of yourself, a rock star aspect of yourself, you know, a, an aspect of yourself that is tender and vulnerable and don't know what's going to happen next kind of an aspect. So it's allowing yourself to be. These aren't, you know, exactly basic tips but that's kind of like what's inspired me anyway to to become the trainer that i am a speaker that i'm so um yeah so i, I so that what how does that translate to a tip that translates to a tip like this don't be rigidly stuck on how things have to be when you go onto a stage whether you're talking to a group of five people or whatever number of people you're there to add value and contribute. You're not there for yourself. You're actually there for yourself and for them. Both. Both. Yeah. I'm not sure if I've answered nah, your question. That's awesome, mate. I love that. <laughs> and love the Prince of Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson is one of my favorites as well. I've, you know, taught myself how to dance over the years. And, um, you know, he's been a big impact on that as well, mate. So, and I love those different yeah, personas and, um, you know, that you, you bring into that. That's a really awesome tip there. So thank you for sharing that, Joe. And um, it's, it's been an extremely powerful episode um, that, you know, you've been sharing with us today of emotional fitness and all these different elements along with how we can get our um, message across um, much more. And I guess as we're wrapping up, um, yeah, what, what one key piece of advice would you like to give, you know, to entrepreneurs yeah. watching listening today? Be, be loyal to yourself. Be loyal to yourself. Be loyal to your values. Be loyal to what you think about different things and have a very healthy way of expressing that to people that love you and you love them. You, you have those two things, you're, you're, you're doing pretty good. Yeah, I love that. Loyalty is extremely powerful. And 
Yeah, we connected through our networks, you know, where I learned about your awesome journey from, yeah, doing your university degree and, you know, majoring in psychology and sociology to learning coaching um, and NLP and training in excess of 7,000 coaches. And I've been, uh, you know, uh, had the pleasure of being in your room, get, being trained by you and and hearing your speeches. Um, you're an awesome guy. I'm sure everyone will agree to this. And, uh, you know, you're very mm -hmm. attuned to your emotions and how you can help others do the same. And I'm sure you continue to make a difference in the world through your intentions and your speeches. And, you know, I'm very grateful that we connected and I look forward to working with you. So Joe, how can people, yeah, find you and get in contact with you and learn more? Yeah, cool. Thanks, Nathan. I appreciate all your kind words. I really do. Um, yeah. So if, if, if you've got Facebook, um, the best way to stay connected is to join, ask to join my, my private group, which is called the Emotional Fitness Hub. Um, and so what I do on the hub, the emotional fitness hub is every Wednesday, I do a little mini training that goes for about 15 minutes. There's a plethora of live videos there recorded. I've been doing them for a couple of years there in the hub. Um, and yeah, some great resources there, the free resources that people can connect with and listen to and, and hopefully, you know, be inspired by. Um, if you don't have Facebook and, um, or, or you have got Facebook, there's other avenues. Um, you can go to Joe Pane, just my name, .com.au. There's access there to 77 something episodes, 70 something episodes of my insights podcast, which once again are just little short, sharp, short, sharp snippets into, into life and all good things. So they're little 15, 20 minute. It's I designed those podcasts, Ethan. So I was imagining my listeners just having a cup of tea or a coffee. And by the time they finish the podcast episode is complete and they can get on with their day. So it's a little 15, 20 minute cuppa and listening to some insight. And then, and then some of those insights have been inspired uh, through me by amazing people. So that, that link there is on the joepane.com.au website and there's some other there's a couple other links there where you can download some cool resources. So so they're the two avenues, the website or the Emotional Fitness Hub uh, closed Facebook group on Facebook. Yeah, awesome guys. Definitely check out Joe, amazing guy if you want to learn more um, about him and the Emotional Fitness Formula. And, and thank you to everyone for watching and listening to this show where we talk about everything on business growth. And please like, subscribe and leave us a five-star review. And you can find me on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram and YouTube as Ethan Cassiotis or visit my website, ethancassiotis.com. And if you want to grow and scale your business, you can reach out to me on any platform to see if we're a good fit. And I completely agree with you, or do I? The only way we know is if you tune in next time. So until next time, remember that our business grows when we learn skills and take action using them in spite of fear. So remember to design your growth and results. Mm -hmm.